All right, guys, it's the next day, and I'm out here for my first ride on the Hyper E Ride 29er. Um, took a bunch of the stickers off, but you can see there's still a lot of glue left. <laughs> I gotta get some goo gone and wipe that off, but um, the bike's uh, as well adjusted as I could have done. The brakes are definitely rubbing, but um, uh, the fork is absolutely rubbish. It's probably, I don't know, 20 or 30 meters travel now that I've actually ridden it. Uh, and the brakes are terrible, they're just stealing and don't stop their legs. These handlebars are definitely way too narrow. Um, the drivetrain actually works pretty well. All seven gears, no problems there. This might be a good time to talk about the difference between a uh, mid-drive motor and a rear-drive motor. So this rear-drive hub motor is a lot cheaper than a mid-drive. Uh, the reason uh, it pushes more of the weight back on the bike, which is kind of undesirable for that 50-50 weight distribution. This motor, at least, it doesn't have any kind of torque sensor. It's not sensing how hard I pedal, it's just sensing the rate at which I pedal. Uh, and I don't think there's a whole bunch of sequence on this cadence sensor either, because the amount of power that the motor is giving me is, really has no connection whatsoever to how hard I'm pedaling or how fast I'm pedaling. It's just kind of either on or off. So, you lose a lot of that precision that you would get in a mid -rise. One thing I really like about the 29er is it comes with this um, chain stay. And uh, according to Kev Central, that really cuts down on the chain drops. And I really like the uh, red jockey wheel on the Churney TZ derailleur as well. And we're getting started right off the bat with can't stop. <laughs> Bad brakes. Got a little descent here. I could not stop on that with these brakes, so. You gotta be a little extra cautious and bike defensively. <laughs> These brakes are just a suggestion to the bike to slow down. It doesn't always slow the bike down. <laughs> oh god. I can't remember the last time I had mechanical brakes. Probably on my beach cruiser. In spite of what some other reviewers have said, you really should not disable the uh, brake motor cutoff where engaging the brake cuts off power to the motor. You want to keep that because not only do I find the motor comes on at like some inopportune times if you're trying to go get through switchbacks or something like that, but also you have no way of knowing if that motor will just freak out and I'm sorry, you have no way of knowing if that controller will freak out and just engage the motor when you're not even pedaling. And if that happens, you're gonna need to stop somehow. And these weak ass brakes are not gonna stop that motor. So definitely keep that. If you upgrade the brakes, definitely make sure you get e-bike brakes with a motor cut off. And if you keep this in stock form, just know that that motor cut off is saving your butt. I guess one trick you could do if you're navigating tight switchbacks is just gently ride the brake so that way the motor doesn't turn on. That seems to be working right here. I'm just gently, ever so slightly, gently tapping that front brake and the rear brake and it is cutting off the motor. So that works pretty good. So here's one of those tight areas I was telling you about where I've actually got the motor in mid assist. And I'm just braking strategically to disengage the motor when I really don't want it to kick in. I thought it might be a good idea to talk a little bit about how I ended up with this bike um, and the process for picking a bike like this E-Ride 29er. There's a reason this guy is 10 times cheaper. Is it worth it? Yeah, I think it's worth it. But it's, it's worse. Ooh. I take it? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, this hardtail gets pretty unsettled <laughs> on rocks. I was going down that, that tiny drop with a root and maybe a rock and I just felt the rear wheel jump over like two inches to the left on me. <laughs> Keeps it interesting. Keeps you honest. Let's not fall here. Oh shit, oh shit. 
and a drop. Okay. <laughs> oh shit. Okay. I'm having fun, but it's uh, mostly because I'm scared of falling <laughs> and laughing at this much lower quality bike than I'm used to, but still an awesome deal. I'm kind of struggling with myself. $600. How are they able to make money on a $600 bike that they give away for free when one is delayed in shipping for a few days? That is nuts. That is absolutely bananas. Of course, I would have much preferred a full suspension electric bike on a budget as my backup bike. But there's not really any, anything on the market right now. Walmart has one that's like a thousand bucks. I know Amazon has some, but they all use garbage components. Shocks, you've never heard of that company. Let's see if I can get through here. And uh, weird looking designs or they're folding, which is really bad for a mountain bike. So I haven't seen anything good as far as budget full suspension electric mountain bikes. If you guys know of any, let me know in the comments below. Maybe that'll be my next project. What would be really hot is if someone figured out how to use this frame and battery on a mid-drive. I know that uh, people have talked about that, but I don't think anyone's done that just yet. That would be super hot. Maybe put a speed sensor on, the, on here, on the back wheel, so you can get one of those fancy LED displays. That'd be super sweet. Then people might really think this is a legit bike. <laughs> All right, got a little bridge here. Yeah, I can handle this. You know, as far as the uh, price point, uh, this guy's $600. By the time I'm done with it, making it trail ready, it's gonna be probably $1,800 is my guess. For $1,800, you could buy a hell of a full suspension acoustic bike with no, mo no electric motor. I did think about doing that, but I actually have a hardtail uh, acoustic bike at home. I did think about doing that. Uh, I actually had a uh, acoustic full suspension. It was a Giant Trance X3 29er. Uh, I had that a couple years ago and I had to sell it to get my Cube Stereo Hybrid. And uh, to tell the truth, I've never looked back. Like, after moving to electric, I mean, forget the climbing, forget the access to new trails. Just going faster is more fun. You know, like on a flat trail, if you can go five miles an hour or 10 miles an hour with your normal cadence, I'd rather go 10. God, these brakes are awful. <laughs> I didn't adjust them professionally or anything, but I did the best I could. As far as the trade-off between stopping and rolling resistance when you're not braking. And uh, yeah, the brakes, the fork, they're not built even for green trails, I feel like. Unless you're a hardcore beast like Tony Ferreira. <sighs> What's up, Tony? We need to ride some time, man. I'm only four hours from you. I'm thinking about driving out there once I get my upgraded bike so I can keep up with you. You know, as far as e-bikes with an integrated battery and frame, you're not gonna find anything for less than $600. This is literally the cheapest that you will find other than the uh, $400 version with the rim brakes. Uh, that actually might be fine for many of you if you can figure out the chain drop issues and if you plan on upgrading to good brakes, which this bike also needs. These disc brakes are rubbish and uh, I don't plan on keeping those. But at least I'm out here on the trail. You can hear the 20 millimeter fork doing its thing, making weird sounds. <laughs> um, so yeah, I definitely love the integrated frame. Something just 
made a weird sound. I hope that was not part of the bike. Um, yeah, I'm viewing this bike as an upgrading candidate at this point. Definitely need to do something about the handlebars, the brakes, probably the fork. I'm not hardcore like my man Tony Ferreira out in Vegas who's riding down mountains on this thing stock. No, no, no. If we're gonna do it Mr. Ocelot style, I'm gonna probably put a uh, $300 fork on this bad boy. Yeah, power delivery is uh, not at all predictable. It kind of just kicks on and kicks off whenever it wants to. Um, it's great for hills. You know, if you're climbing, I think it'll, you know, it's 250 watts behind you and that'll always be welcome when you're climbing or traveling long distance cross country. In these downhill type sections, to be honest, you're not using it at all. So if I was going downhill for, you know, a quarter mile, half mile, something like that, I would just straight up turn off the motor. And I would also recommend turning off the motor if you're in very tight spaces where you don't want the motor to kick in, say like in switchbacks or something like that, narrow switchbacks. This motor is not appropriate for that. So it takes a little bit of rider skill, I think, to understand that and turn it off when it's not gonna help you. It's gonna actually hurt you more than it helps. The drivetrain, um, I'm pretty much like in the lowest gear here on the trail because the rocks and the undulations of the trail are upsetting my momentum enough that just these really first two gears are the only useful ones. So if you were to bring this up any climbs, uh, you would definitely need to upgrade the, the drivetrain. Sorry guys, this is my first time riding a hardtail in many years, so I'm being very, very conservative. I hate falling, and I'm gonna try to avoid doing that today. I feel like the best way to avoid falling on a less capable bike that I'm not even used to is to just stick to the green trail. Let's see if I can get over this hill. Oh, and by the way, I'm only in low, low setting right now, so I'll try that again with the high setting. When I was riding this on the street earlier, these power modes didn't seem to do much. It was kind of like, medium, faster medium, and fastest medium. Compared to the what I'm used to, the uh, difference in power is not really noticeable, as noticeable as my other bike, but let's see if high helps. I was able to get up this guy a bit before. Let's see if I'm able to do it again. Low skier, high setting. Now I'm gonna stand up. Oh yeah, no problem. Uh, okay, it kind of died out at the end there. Yeah, this drivetrain, let's see if it even gets up this hill. I'm gonna have to stand up, I'm sure. Ew, ah, barely. Just barely made it up that. And that was a very gentle hill, so. I think one of the things I'm gonna need to do to make this trail ready is change out the freewheel in the back so that the low gear ratio is similar, if not the same to my cube stereo hybrid because the whole reason you need an e-bike is for climbing. It doesn't do much for you going downhill. And uh, usually gravity has me going faster than I actually want to on the trail when I'm going downhill. Okay, we got a pedal here. And there we go. <laughs> I'm constantly afraid of this motor kicking on at the wrong time. As long as you know about it, it's manageable, but it's not like a well-built e-bike in that regard. Now I realize some of you might not be so interested in riding this on the trail. Maybe you want to use it as a commuter or as a baby buggy. Uh, the bike actually has uh, mounts on the frame for that sort of thing. You want to put a, a rack on the back. So that's nice. My carbon frame cube stereo hybrid doesn't have those. 
So hey, you keep finding new things that this guy has that mine doesn't. Like the kickstand. I'll tell you what, that walk feature comes in handy because when it comes to those big drops <laughs> and features on the trail, I'm walking those. So having the motor helping me push all 40 something pounds of this bike, that's nice to have. Let me show you guys a little hack for uh, you newbie e-bikers. If you want to turn around in a tight space, here's how I do it. I throw the walk mode on, so this six kilometer button on the controls. I'm gonna throw that walk mode on, spin the back wheel, lift up with the handlebars, and let the motor flip the bike over for me, and then brake to disengage the motor. New tires would be a good idea, I think. This is equipped with um, 2.3s. Um, the inner diameter of the wheel is 24 millimeters, so you could upgrade up to 2.4s. Uh, I did look into getting a new wheel set so I can go even wider, but that's probably cost prohibitive. These 2.3 inch wide tires, I don't trust them. You see the uh, tread on the side? It's just totally round. This is a street tire, guys. Yeah, I've only ridden this about half a mile and already my ass and my arms feel it. <laughs> because I got the saddle banging into my under, undercarriage and my shoulders. <laughs> All right, guys, my first drop here. Wish me luck. Ooh, <laughs> that was super tough. Uh, undercarriage just banging into my underside. And that's a factor of this being a hardtail. The uh, slip-on grips are constantly shifting as I'm riding. Um, so, some lock-on grips would be nice. I think I actually really would like to have a trigger shifter. Okay, let's take this. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Saddles keep me from getting as far back as I want. God, I hope I didn't get myself poisoned at Ivy back there. <laughs> that would really suck and make this video almost not worth it. <laughs> And I just touched my nose on accident. You guys see all the poison ivy on this poison oak on the side of the trail? It's just everywhere. I forgot that about this place. <laughs> oh dear. All right guys, so I'm back from my first trail ride with the Hyper E-Ride 29. Uh, how did it go? It's kind of a mixed bag. Um, the frame held up. I didn't have any concerns about the frame. The tires, you know, they're fine for um, easy trails or the street, but um, they're not good mountain bike tires that's for sure and you know they got tubes in them right now so they don't have the best traction uh, especially on um, cornering and stuff because this is a pretty rounded style tire and um, you know the more square style I think is better at cornering uh, the fork the fork is a joke but we knew that there's probably oh you can see actually the dirt you can see how much travel it had I think we've got a world exclusive here, y'all. I'm measuring 55 millimeters on the fork travel. So you heard it here for it first. 55 millimeter pogo stick spring coil fork. Um, but yeah, that's, it was not a good performer. Uh, making terrible sounds on the rocky sections and uh, you know, it, it definitely helped. It was better than a rigid fork, that's for sure on some of those drops I was taking. But uh, the fork, you know, that's gonna be one of the most expensive parts that I upgrade. Uh, also the brakes and maybe the dropper. But the fork is a, a necessary upgrade, I think, for any kind of blue trails for sure. Onto the cockpit. Uh, you know, I don't mind that this A10 display too much because we don't have a speed sensor on the wheel, so there's really nothing else to, to show. Uh, it's nice and simple and uh, does the job. This stem here, um, you know, I think I measured it yesterday. At, was it 70 or was it 75 millimeters? Yeah, it's too long. I don't like that geometry. I want to go with a shorter stem. Handlebars too. Uh, these are 620 millimeter. I think I'm probably going to go with 
800 millimeters because I believe that's what I have on my uh, cube stereo hybrid. So I'm just used to that. Works well for me. Uh, the grips are garbage. They are slip on. They don't lock in place. I'm just very easily twisting this all the way around and uh, gives you no leverage or confidence whatsoever on the trail. Um, the twist shift, you know, I, it didn't bother me, but at the same time, I know that having a trigger shift would just do a better job of keeping my hands on the handlebars and focused on steering instead of shifting gears and stuff. So, you know, today I stayed in the first two gears for the most part, but I have a feeling once I shift to a, uh, a better gear ratio for climbing, with my freewheel, I have a feeling I'm going to be using the trigger shifter more. So I'm, um, that goes with upgrading the freewheel, I think. I've got to upgrade this this shifter. I do like the look of this frame. For 600 bucks, internal cable routing, the geometry. The geometry was fine. Um, it feels like a 50-50 weight distribution bike. Uh, I know part of that is, I know it's not. I know there's more weight on the back wheel right now. And um, I know part of the distribution is this heavy steel fork in the front, but yeah, it, it feels fine. It doesn't feel um, like it's light in the front yet. Pedals, um, they're alloy at least, you know, they worked, but I did not feel like they were doing a good job of keeping me connected to the bike. So that, uh, you know, pedals are cheap. That's probably a good upgrade to do. The saddle. Um, it's definitely too narrow for my sit bones. Um, I believe I use like a large, maybe an extra large for my WTB saddle. So, um, you know, you can't make those fit everyone, but um, it's a nice looking saddle. It feels like good quality, but um, it just doesn't fit me. So I need to upgrade probably to my WTB bolt. And the freewheel, I'm definitely gonna have to change that out. Uh, I wanna get the same climbing ratio as my Cube Stereo Hybrid. If not, maybe a little better, um, just because I think this rear hub motor is on the trail. It doesn't feel as powerful as my Cube Stereo Hybrid mid-drive. It feels like maybe uh, half as powerful. So now that you guys have seen this thing on the trail, are there any specific upgrades you would suggest? 